So yeah, once again, here we are. I'm going to pass it over to Bill. Let um, Bill give us a few um, words, and then we'll we'll move on over to Jeff. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the very first of our uh, new season of Archaeology Cafe's 14th um, season in a row uh, that we've been putting on these cafes. So um, that means somebody in this group must be old. But um, anyway, the this is going to be fully um, on Zoom throughout the, the full season. And in order to accommodate the uh, ongoing pandemic. And it's a great opportunity for us to share with all of you what our staff does day in, uh, week in, uh, month and year in and out. So um, we're gonna focus on sort of from our home to your home um, is the theme. And there's a lot of different stories of, of uh, how we do preservation archaeology at Archaeology Southwest. So we really look forward to sharing that with, it, with everyone. Um, so tonight, um, Linda Pierce and Jeff Clark are downtown in our Tucson office. I'm coming to you from my Tucson home. And Tucson is the traditional uh, lands of the Tana Atum Nation. And as Jeff will show um, as he gets into his uh, discussion of Safford tonight, that area has a complex uh, history where there's Pueblo um, lands, Autumn lands, and Apache lands over the course of time. So um, one of the wonderful things about this, uh, this cafe series that is on Zoom is that you folks are coming from a much wider audience than we can accommodate when you have to show up uh, in person at, at, in Tucson. So as we shift into gear here, think about the traditional lands of the native peoples of wherever you are on the landscape today. So uh, the always need a little bit of um, logistics. And one of the important things is to acknowledge our generous uh, sponsors that make this possible. The, Smith Living Trust. Um, thank you, uh, Smith family, for all that you've done to support this uh, series over many, many years. So much appreciated. So Jeff's going to be sharing the history and archaeology of a place that maybe many of the folks haven't had a chance to really um, see on the ground. It's a, a little off the beaten path. Um, so it's kind of the transition, the Safford Valley uh, between the Middle Gila and the Upper Gila, which are two pro uh, programs that we have here at, at Archaeology Southwest. And it's quite a place. So I want to turn things over to Jeff and he can share with us uh, the story of Safford and ancient Arizona's forgotten cosmopolitan center. So thank you, Jeff. And it's, it's all yours. We'll disappear off the screen and, and uh, let you take over. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us during these crazy times. And hopefully we can take your mind off of them for a little while tonight. Um, yes, my talk tonight is going to be on, on the Safford area um, and thinking of it as a cosmopolitan center. And I'm going to break down my talk into sort of a forgotten part, a, cosmo, a center part, and a, and a cosmopolitan part to kind of make my argument. Um, this is just uh, putting Safford Basin on the map. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a map of Southwest archeological cultures um, and um, showing where the Safford Basin is here. And um, thinking about it as a center, I mean, when we think about the whole calm, we generally think about the Phoenix Basin as the big center and maybe Tucson as a, as a center. And we don't really think about Safford Basin. When you think about the Mimbris, or the, the Mogollon, um, the Mimbers Valley is all, often uh, focused on, um, even though there, it was probably a, had a relatively small population. But sitting in between is the is the Safford Basin, which uh, is in a great place along the Gila, a lot of farmland, and probably a lot of ancient inhabitants. And just to show you that it's kind of, um, if I can follow my mouse, it's kind of near the Hoakam Mogollon boundary. Uh, those archaeological cultures. And it's also in the middle of the Salado, which is a later uh, 
uh, phenomenon that we've talked about a lot at, here at Archaeology Southwest um, um, uh, as, a as an integrative religion. And you can see that uh, Safford Basin is in the middle of this. So uh, going to the forgotten theme, um, this is a um, quote by uh, Colonel Hodges, uh, letter uh, excerpt from a letter from Colonel Hodges uh, on the Safford Basin in 1875 before there was much settlement in the region. A thorough examination of the ruins left behind by a number of prehistoric races is needed under some authority of the government or by some well-known historical society before all their old works are obliterated by the plow of the husbandman. Unfortunately, the um, husbandman uh, pretty much won that battle um, in terms of uh, the archeology. span um, This is just kind of a blow up, uh, not the most beautiful map, but hopefully it has some good utilitarian function because I'll be using it throughout the night. Um, these are all sites that we have uh, some information from. They're largely dating to the late pre-Hispanic period, 1200 to 1450 AD in the Safford Basin or uh, Eastern Safford Basin, more, uh, moreover, uh, and um, um, in vicinity. Um, and you notice this is really the main part of the Safford Basin. And you can see uh, there's very few sites there. Um, this is where a lot of people should be living. And um, why there are so few sites there are, is because of the uh, amount of agriculture that went on starting in the 1880s. It became a, 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 a largely a Mormon farming community, fairly insular. And uh, um, at that point in time, grew quickly, uh, incorporated a number of towns uh, 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 into Safford and then other towns around it. And uh, while Fuchs and Bandelier and Huff visited some parts of Safford, even then in the early late 1800s and early 1900s, um, a fair bit of the uh, archaeological re record in the center was gone. Um, and then for the next 70 years or so, nobody very much, pretty much nobody really worked, uh, no archaeologists really worked in the Safford Basin. Um, so what we're left with is kind of a, a rim around of, uh, of knowledge around what was largely the populated zone and very little information about this heavily populated zone. Um, just a, a quick cast of characters here. Jack and Vera Mills, um, avocational archaeologists, they excavated Salado sites across the southeast Arizona and southwest Mexico for, oh, from the 1940s to the 1970s. The picture up here is uh, them in the 1930s before they started excavating, and this is sort of an after picture. Uh, they excavated one site in the Safford Basin, a very important site that I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about, the Buena Vista Curtis site in the early 70s. Uh, more importantly, um, you see all these Salado polychrome pots behind them, um, or, or pots from various um, of their various excavations. Um, and they allowed the local Eastern Arizona College to purchase much of their whole vessel collection. Uh, Jack dug hundreds of rooms um, um, and uh, for, for a very cheap price. Um, and uh, that collection is on display at, in the admin building at Eastern Arizona College. And anybody who, uh, I, I recommend anybody who's interested in seeing it, it is a world-class collection of, of, of largely Salado polychromes. Uh, Jeffrey Brown uh, did the first Safford Basin dissertation I'm aware of about the same time the Millses were out there in the 1970s. Unfortunately, he passed away at an early age in, the, in, in 1980, and um, that took care of archaeology there for a little while. Um, this is a picture of Betty Lee and Aunt, our Anna Noozle, who was our preservation archaeology fellow who wrote her dissertation on the Safford Basin. Um, Betty, this is near the end of her life. She was kind of the matriarch, local matriarch of Safford Basin archaeology from the 1970s into the 2000s. She taught at Eastern Arizona College. And her and several of her colleagues, um, West Jernigan, Pam Rule, who also, uh, Pam Rule also died very young in a tragic accident, um, 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 were the, the, the Eastern Arizona College um, archaeologists on the ground. And they excavated and, and did some minor reports on a number of sites. Um, Anna 
So uh, Betty Lee has now passed away and Anna's, Anna's actually moved on. Um, one person who's actually stuck around and one archeologist that's actually stuck around in, um, in Safford Basin, in Safford archeology span for a long time is Jim Neely. Um, with his, uh, as his role as a professor at University of Texas at Austin. Um, he was introduced to the region, I think, uh, or got interested in the region by, with working with Kyle Woodson in the mid 1990s. And Kyle did his thesis on, MA thesis on the Goat Hill site, a very, very important site uh, in terms of understanding the Salado in the Safford Basin and then Jennifer Rinker's uh, uh, thesis as well. Um, but then going into the 2000s, he focused on, um, on, on more of the agricultural systems that are still remaining in the, um, uh, in the Safford Valley uh, or basin on, on the terraces uh, in, in the Bajada area. First with William Doolittle and later with a uh, local um, archeologist, Don Lancaster. And I'll be talking a little bit about those later. So Jim is one of the few archeologists that stuck around in the Safford Basin, but really there's not a lot of active field work there. And so much as so much, so much archeology span was, was pretty much destroyed by plowing and agricultural activities before archeologists got into it, into the area. And those archeologists that have come since have largely kind of come and left. So it really is kind of a forgotten area um, in terms of archeology, span despite I th what I think its obvious importance is. Um, this is just a map showing some of the excavations. Um, um, I want to point out Left Hand Canyon here. This is a very important area in Safford. And you can see the University of Texas uh, excavations focused there, the red dots. There was also some e, uh, Eastern Arizona College excavations. Um, and this is where the mills dug, uh, Buena Vista Curtis. Um, this is a very important site because it is in the floodplain. It's one of the large, perhaps one of the largest sites ever uh, constructed in the Safford Basin, certainly the largest we have. Uh, uh, um, um, records of, and it's right where the Safford Basin um, opens up. So it's an ideal place for agriculture. So that's kind of the case for forgotten. But before I move on, I just want to mention that, uh, and uh, a shout out to uh, the Archaeology Southwest volunteers led by Jay Smith, um, about Raven Robinson, who is a, uh, an avocational archeologist who worked in the Safford area in the 1950s and 60s. And he did excavate a number of sites in the Safford floodplain and collected everything from them. And we're currently processing and, um, and analyzing those artifacts. So that should at least add a few more data points. So Safford as a, uh, as a center. Um, this is the excerpts from the same letter from Colonel Hodges. Uh, there are ruins scattered for a distance of 40 miles on both sides of the Gila River. That sounds impressive. Um, also, uh, evidence of irrigation before any uh, Anglo settlers uh, were there, um, including an immense uh, acequia that was uh, 25 feet in width. So that's our our first glimpse at what might what was there uh, before uh, it was uh, uh, subjected to a, a lot of uh, farming and plowing. Um, many of you have probably seen this slide before, but we now have uh, the Tucson Basin has been um, um, blessed with a lot of intensive excavation in the floodplain. We now have irrigation agriculture uh, dated in the Tucson Basin to 1200 BC. I just point out uh, these are the canals and you can see these raised borders uh, fields. It's nice how they outlined them in white for us. Um, um, and these would have been kind of uh, uh, grids where they would have planted uh, crops like maize and irrigated in the Santa Cruz floodplain. So this this was a, this is at Las Capas excavated with, uh, by Jim Vint, um, and this is a incredible find um, um, in Tucson, and Safford, and it was done through uh, contract archaeology work, I should say, and uh, in in Safford we also have some contract archaeology work that's been done, including a project, my last project I ran in the early two thousands, 
And we identified uh, very limited exposures in the Safford area, but we, uh, I, I, I identified canals that dated to the early AD period. And then uh, another project, I think run by Tierra right of way, uh, uh, pushed them back into the BC period, not as far back as 1200 BC, but we have a very, very narrow glimpse of what's going on in Safford. We know, do know they're doing irrigation relatively early. Um, this is a very well um, distributed map of canals in the, in the Phoenix area. Um, these are uh, reconstructed um, prehistoric canals. Um, just to give you some scale here, that's eight kilometers and uh, some very, very, de very, very, very de detailed reconstructions of, 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 of uh, these are pre-Hispanic uh, uh, canals. And uh, uh, I think this is probably representing the, the later manifestation of the system. Um, and um, it's something we wish we had everywhere else, including this Afford Basin where we have so, such little data. But you can see there's obviously some very large canals that are going you know, 15 or 20 kilometers. Um, what we do have in the Safford Basin is that the Mormon uh, communities in particular have kept very good records of their historic canals. Um, and um, they even have records of uh, basically uh, in the 1880s when they first arrived, um, basically digging out Ho'okam canals and constructing their first canals uh, um, in, in Ho'okam canals. Um, so uh, this is the Safford Basin again, or Safford. Um, and these are the uh, canal systems today. The dotted red lines are um, extensions. So these are obviously something that, that has been added on, um, 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 you know, after the, the original constructions. But the solid red lines are the original uh, canals uh, built in the Safford Basin in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. And you can see some of them like the, um, what is this, the, uh, um, Oh wait, what is it? The Union Union Canal and uh, the Fort Thomas Canal. Some of these are getting pretty long. There's the scale down there, five kilometers. So we're talking about uh, 15, 20 kilometer long canals. And if we can infer uh, that these early alignments, uh, were they were digging out a lot of Ho'okam canals. This could be more or less the kind of the the, the, the largest uh, extent of uh, pre-Hispanic canal system. It's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a leap, but it's all we have from the Safford Basin right now um, um, in, in the floodplain in terms of trying to reconstruct um, um, canals and canal systems. Um, this is a segment of the Smithville Canal. Um, just to show you, it's basically looking very much like a whole comp canal. It's basically just an earthen canal with no lining or whatsoever. And that's being used still in the, uh, in 2004. I also want to point next, my next slide is to these uh, gridded fields. Um, and this again, goes back to the work by Neely. Um, this is a photograph by Adriel Heise of, 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 of them, um, at least uh, one of the largest groups of them. Um, and uh, uh, William Doolittle and Jim Neely uh, wrote a, a uh, a monograph on this and argued largely that they were being used for agave cultivation. So we're above the floodplain where they'd be growing maize. They've got to be growing something else probably up here. So we've got very intensive uh, agave cultivation going on. And these these gridded fields, they're, 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 they're in other places on, on other terraces in, in Arizona, but really in the Safford area, they are incredibly dense. Um, um, and uh, this is a, a nice, pretty photo by Adriel, but Jim gave me this photo that shows you the uh, extent of the one of the largest systems. Um, it's going for uh, uh, literally uh, looks like kilometers there, and um, they defined uh, boundaries markers. Uh, uh, so there were boundary markers. Some of them had petroglyphs on them. Um, the dating of the ceramics from the sites or, 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 or scatters in this area largely date to 1000 to 1300, I think, uh, looking at the, the table. But it shows you not only were they probably doing a lot of very intensive irrigation agriculture in the floodplain, but they were intensively using the, uh, the terrace, uh, terraces uh, above the floodplain, especially on, on the north side of, of Safford. Um, we go on the south side, and I'm taking this right from 
of these are these are ripped right out of uh, uh, Neely and Lancaster 2019 uh, their recent uh, Journal of Field Archaeology uh, article. Um, there's um, Safford again over here, and um, so we're looking on the south side. And what they've traced is, uh, and this is actually also fairly unique to Safford, these very long and linear um, uh, canals that are actually coming off the mountain slopes and into the terraces above the floodplain. Um, this is really unique. In fact, um, um, when archaeologists first saw these, they thought they were probably, oh, there's, these are probably just historic Borman canals because there's just nothing like this out there in the pre-Hispanic period. But um, as you can see, there's a lot of sites. These are all sites uh, that are running along these courses of canals and a lot of settlement. And they make a really good argument in that article that these are actually uh, pre-Hispanic uh, canals. And they're really intensively using this area and they're really doing a lot to get water to fields. And they even, the, the, they, they call these uh, hanging canals, but this looks like a trail. Um, But if you walk it, it's actually got a indentation in it. There's there's um, prehistoric artifacts along it. It's actually a canal where they've cut into the bank and then used a berm to, to sort of in a cut and fill process to literally create a hanging canal to go around this this uh, this hill. And there's a number of, of, of instances of this. So if we think about um, uh, how much they're using the area outside the floodplain, um, um, both on the north and south sides of Safford, they've got to be using uh, the floodplain very intensively too, especially during this, uh, you know, by 1300 AD. And if they are, um, I mean, if they're really using the full carrying capacity of Safford Basin, you, uh, if the Phoenix Basin has 30 or 40,000 people in it at, at a maximum population, the Safford could easily have maybe in the 20 or 30,000 range. So that's my case for the Safford being a center. Um, um, the, the, that very intensive use of that agricultural landscape. In terms of cosmopolitan, um, basically out of the Webster uh, dictionary composed of persons, constituents, or elements from all or many parts of the world. And if we look at the Safford Basin, um, it's kind of halfway between the Members Valley and the Phoenix Basin. And as I noted earlier, it's sort of, it's, it's definitely in the irrigation zone of the, uh, that the Hohokam, uh, you know, the Hohokam are very much associated with irrigation agriculture. Uh, but it's also um, the, the Mogollon region um, as well uh, near the boundary. And um, as I said before, there's also, uh, it's right in the middle of the Salado. And, um, we can kind of break this uh, interaction, I think, uh, in terms of thinking about cosmopolitan into two time periods, 700 to 1300 AD, where we have really very little information from Safford and, and talking about Hohokam, Muggio interaction, and 1275 to 1450, where we have migration from the Kayenta region um, that has been demonstrated into Safford Basin and other parts of the Southeast Arizona and their role in the development of a, a Salado religion closely tied to Salado polychromes. So let's go with the early period first. First, um, there's some CRM projects that have been, uh, or contract projects that have excavated a few pit houses um, um, in the Safford Basin, um, but actually very little work has been done for the 700 to 1100 time period where, where people are largely living in pit houses. However, we do have, um, 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 ball court information. Uh, ball courts are lo have long associated with the Hohokam, largely developed in the Phoenix Basin region, and then spread outward eastward. And you have some of the most eastward uh, ba uh, ball courts in the, in the Safford Basin, including at that uh, Curtis Buena Vista site, that big, large site uh, right where the Safford Basin opens up. Um, um, and um, this is actually a, a, a ball court um, at uh, Reddington Ruin. These are thought to be the bleachers and they play the ball court somewhere, the ball game inside the, uh, the court. Um, 
this is in a farmyard in, in, in uh, Safford. This is uh, the, the Buena Vista Curtis ball court. A nice shot taken by Henry Wallace there. There's a huge um, um, uh, la later site, a Salado site that's uh, around this. But this, this is, this is um, probably one of the best places to do agriculture in the Safford area. Nice large ball court, very strong Hocom signature there. Also, um, Hocom largely associated with uh, middle uh, with buff making buffware right on buff pottery using paddle and anvil, anvil man manufacture. Um, most of this buffware is being made in the middle Gila portion of the Phoenix Basin, very centralized production, and then trading outwards to other places in the Hocom region. Um, um, What's interesting is that we have local production in the Safford Basin by at least uh, uh, 1000 AD, suggesting that we actually have Hohokam potters moving in um, from Phoenix into this area. Uh, and, and there's not many areas outside of uh, uh, the Middle Hewlett and the Phoenix Basin where we have this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this buffer production. So we think the irrigation, the ball courts, the, the buffer production, this is, this is not uh, you know, a boundary type of interaction. This is, there's a lot of strong Hohokam presence in the Safford Basin. Turning to Muggio influence, there's a, a local uh, uh, tradition of painted pottery early on, um, but they're also uh, getting a lot of pottery uh, from the members area. Um, and um, um, those Archaeologists who work in the Mimbris area uh, describe Mimbris as very much a kind of a, a club. You're either in or out. Um, um, and uh, you either have a fair, a fair bit of Mimbris pottery or you have none at all. And from what we know, little we know of this early time period in Saf Safford, there is a fair bit of Mimbris pottery in this area. You go one valley further east or you go into the San Pedro, very little Mimbris pottery. Um, it's made with a coil and scrape manufacturer, very different from the whole com pottery. And we also have um, um, evidence, uh, geochemical evidence that this is made in the Safford Basin uh, by 1050 or so um, um, as well. So it's not only is members being traded from the members Valley members pottery, but it's actually being made in the Safford Basin. So that's a very strong um, um, interaction. Um, um, and a lot of a lot of uh, archaeologists have tried to make connections between Membris and Ho Kam, especially early in the in the classic Membris sequence. And um, um, if you're looking for that connection, I think uh, that that uh, the answers, if they still exist, lie in the Safford Basin. Uh, okay, going slightly later in time, um, this is a. Uh, this is kind of like your uh, a variant of your COVID heat maps, but basically it's a, a contour map of, um, of, um, uh, of corrugated density and ceramic assemblages in, um, in Arizona. And uh, just showing a nice corrugated uh, jar from the Robinson collection over here. Um, uh, corrugated ceramics, brown corrugated ceramics, strongly uh, tied to the Muggione and, and especially the Highland Muggione. And you can see the high um, um, densities here. And you can kind of see a finger of corrugated heading into the Safford area and then moving into the uh, San Pedro and then over Rennington Pass into Tucson Basin. We think this tracks actually a migration route of, uh, of, of, of uh, people moving from the Muggione Highlands into Safford. Um, so even more of a connection with uh, the Muggione region. We also think this, this migration route sets the stage for longer distance migration from the Kayanta region. Um, and and uh, once they, plug, they, can, they can plug into this network about here and then continue on down. This is just a, a map of, uh, of our reconstructed uh, routes of migration from the Kayanta region to the Little Colorado River and then breaking up in some, with some groups ending up in um, um, southeastern Arizona. And we've modeled this as a diaspora because this is during the great drought in the Southwest. They, they don't go back to their homeland. They disperse. 
Uh, they're an immigrant minority, even in places where they resettle, uh, but they seem to maintain a persistent identity and maintain connections between uh, themselves after migration. And they both uh, resettle in the Ho'okam and Mugion regions. And these red dots are just basically areas where we know there are strong Kayenta presences, uh, are definite Kayenta enclaves. There's probably many more Kayenta in these areas. These are just really the strong cases of enclaves. We're also showing the Phoenix Basin here in platform mounds, which don't make it in the Safford Basin. The platform mounds are sort of the uh, um, um, they're kind of uh, temple-like structures on top of mounds that are largely associated with the Ho'okam. And it's interesting while we have ball courts in the Safford Basin, we don't have, uh, we don't have platform mounds. Um, so let's focus in on the Safford Basin again. And I'm starting to get close here. Um, that's particularly the Goat Hill site. Well, actually, let me just throw out some, some markers here, how, we're, how we track Kayenta migrants. First, they're making uh, something called Maverick Mountain Polychrome uh, in Southeast Arizona. It's locally made here but it replicates the, almost exactly the decorated pottery they're making uh, in, their, in their homeland. Uh, example of Keats seal polychrome. Other markers, uh, perforated plates. This is a big one for uh, uh, Patrick Lyons and his research. Um, he really loves these perforated plates. Uh, they, we, uh, from his research, we know that they're making pots with these. These are base molds for pots. They're unique to the Kayenta region. Uh, after they migrate, they start showing up in southeastern Arizona. And we don't know what the perforations are for, but uh, they are a Kayenta marker. And finally, these, these things called entry boxes, you have uh, a, a, a slab lined hearth at the floor level, and then you have these large um, kind of front deflector slabs or either outside or, or inside the entry. Uh, once again, in the Kayenta region, prior to 1275, they start showing up in Southern Arizona after uh, uh, 1275. So um, these are just two um, um, enclave, possible enclaves. I mean, Mary Hilda is a possibility here um, and, and def definitely Goat Hill um, uh, here, uh, excavated by Kyle Woodson um, in the 1990s. One of the first really strong cases for migration in the Southwest uh, um, that was made. And I'll focus on Goat Hill here. Um, this is Goat Hill right here, a nice uh, photograph by Henry Wallace. Um, you can see the moon rising and the sun setting. You can see it's got a commanding view of the terrain all the way to the Gila River. Um, in front of it. It's in a very defensive location. And essentially, this is a map of what's on top of it. It's basically um, a kind of an encampment. And we find this in other Kayenta enclaves as well. They settle down. Uh, they, they, they basically um, build kind of a ephemeral or, or um, not so well built kind of uh, settlement, maybe testing the waters, whether they can settle, it, settle or not there. Then they build a kiva uh, if they if, if if they like it, and uh, this is a one of this. I think this is the second kiva uh, identified in, in southern Arizona when when Kyle excavated it, um, and um, this is just a photograph of it, uh, the Goat Hill kiva. But this is this has all the markers of the perforated plates, the Maverick Mountain, the entry boxes of a of a Kayenta enclave. So it was really a smoking gun case. Um, I just want to end up by talking about Anna Newsel's research a little bit. Um, um, basically, when the Kayenta are moving in, uh, we see this interval of tensions uh, between locals and immigrants that's expressed on pottery. The, the migrants have their own pottery, the Maverick Mountain Series, and the locals, including those in Safford, have either a, a red on, continue making red on buff or a red on brown pottery. And uh, what her dissertation uh, tracked in her in, in this in, in, in this monograph is the coming together of these groups over a generation or so, and particularly in the Safford area, she sees evidence of isolation early, and then you see settlements that look um, 
uh, kind of like room blocks and uh, compounds, uh, kind of hybrid architectural forms. And one side of the, 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 the site has more of the uh, local pottery and, uh, and, and the other side of the site has more of uh, the Maverick Mountain. So you see kind of a, a coming together, maybe a lessening of tensions. Um, and then, so this, this would be the ethnic tensions in the late 1200s. You've got the, uh, the immigrants expressing their identity on Maverick Mountain. And then you've got the local tradition um, with the, the red on browns and red on buffs. Um, as you go into the 1300s, both of these are replaced by a new type of pottery uh, called Salata Polychroma, which Gila Polychrome is the early, earliest widespread type in, in Southern Arizona. Um, and um, what's interesting, if we look at um, what's going on in this period, what, from what we have in the Safford Safa Basin, is that what people are coming together, uh, either lo people are aggregating in general, both locals and migrants and locals. Um, Buena Vista Curtis becomes a very, very big site at this time. Um, um, if we go to the area that we know the best, we're uh, University of Texas and uh, EA, uh, Eastern Arizona College excavated. Um, what you have is Goat Hill going out and these are local settlements here and everybody's pretty much moving in the Spear Ranch area. Um, and uh, that includes this settlement um, uh, called uh, Kreider Kiva, which has a Kiva, that's why it's called Kreider Kiva. It has a later type of Kiva right next to Spear Ranch. Everybody seems to be kind of coalescing in this area. So at this point in time, we must, you know, the immigrants and their descendants and the local groups must be getting along okay to do this. Um, Spear Ranch is unfortunately very trashed. It's been very, very badly vandalized. Uh, the EAC report is not published, um, but I should also point out that this area is a real hot spot for Salata polychrome production. Huge uh, uh, geochemical signature and it's being traded uh, to Buena Vista Curtis and other sites that we know about in the Safford Basin. Mary Hilda may also be a Salado polychrome uh, production area as well. So it's interesting that Buena Vista Curtis, the main, we're, we're, the main local center isn't making much Salado polychrome. It's being made here where locals and immigrants are mixing kind of on the margins of, of the Safford Basin. So this is just a picture of the Davis Ranch uh, Kiva in the San Pedro Valley. At, at the, this is a Cayenta Enclave in the San Pedro Valley. Kreider Kiva only exists in notes. And unfortunately, that's, there's, there's really just nothing to, to, to show. But it, the, the, the notes and the, and, and the diagram looks a lot like the Davis Ranch Kiva. It's a later type of Kiva than the, the Goat Hill Kiva. And it's likely that the people from Goat Hill moved down next to Spear Ranch and were basically integrated into that community when they were started making Salado Polychrome. So I'm wrapping up here. Um, and um, just wanting to point out that the Salado, there's a Safford Basin here, is much of a, a part of a much larger phenomenon that we talked about uh, that, that we've been studying at Archaeology Southwest for a long time. And um, basically linking Salado polychromes to uh, Salado religion. We know that um, the Salado polychromes are, um, are made with ancestral Pueblo, specifically Cayenta technology and style. Um, however, uh, they're being consumed in mass quantities, not only in enclaves, but in these, these settlements that include lots of local groups and, and, and uh, across this entire area. So not only the Safford Basin, we're talking about a, an area that goes from the Phoenix Basin to the Mimbris Valley and then from the Mugion Rim almost to the uh, well into southeastern Arizona. So a massive area crossing the members of Holcom region. Uh, it's, it's being produced in many areas, but yet it has a high stylistic homogeneity, which suggests that the ideas on expressed on, on Salado polychrome are very, very, very important. And we've argued elsewhere, and I, I point you to the readings uh, associated with the, uh, uh, this talk, that it represents uh, an inclusive religion, a religion that integrated uh, both uh, uh, Mugion and Cayenta 
groups on one side of the divide and Hohokam and, and Kayanta groups on the other side of the divide. Um, and uh, a, a very inclusive and integrative uh, religion that's reflected on the on these pots. So I should wrap up now for questions. Um, so Safford Basin as an ancient cosmopolitan center. I think I've made the argument that it, it's kind of largely been forgotten. Thank, thank you, Jim, for keeping it on the map and, and Don, Don Lancaster. Um, I think there could have been at least 20, there could have been 25,000 people in Safford area uh, at 1300 at its maximum population, given the intensity of use that we see not only in the floodplain, but um, on the adjacent terraces in, in Bahada. Many roads lead to and through ancient, the ancient Safford Basin. Um, I think it was a real corridor for uh, interaction between the Muggy and Hohokam, particularly during the Balcourt era and between the classic, uh, uh, the, the, the pre-classic Hohokam and the classic period Mimbris. And, um, and also uh, when the Kayanta migrate into the area, it becomes an important, who are ancestral Pueblo uh, group. Um, it becomes uh, very important in the development of uh, Salado religion. However, Safford Basin remains a data gap um, that because it's a data gap, archeologists really just don't think about it that much in terms of its importance. And um, hopefully uh, we can rectify that somehow. And you know, may, uh, thing, uh, collections like the Robinson Collection, I think uh, will help at, at some level. So with that, I will end it and open it up for questions. Um. Thank you, Jeff. I'm trying if I can push my buttons and things here. Um, and yeah, we, if we need to go back to any of your slides, we can. We've got some questions for you. I've been watching them as they come in. And you did really well. You answered some questions um, you know, during your talk. So a so, um, couple of people had some questions about um, irrigation. Um, so Dave Abbott wants to start us off here. He says, do you think that the water use in Safford had an impact on water supply for irrigation along the middle Gila? And how about change through time? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I mean, the potential th is there for that. Um, but since we don't know the extent of those canal systems in Safford, it's really hard to tell, um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember some of the stream flow reconstructions. Um, I, I think, uh, um, um, yeah, I don't know if I really want to answer that question uh, in terms of how much it impacted the middle heel along the, uh, uh, the, the Phoenix Basin. Um, if there were 25,000 people in Safford Basin and they were thor thoroughly using that floodplain, I guess there, there potentially could have been um, um, some impact, um, but so little is known about the Safford Basin uh, floodplain that I, it's, 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 it's really a, a, an exercise in conjecture. Um, well, and, and there you have an example of how science work, works, which is we don't always have all the answers. No. It's okay. <laughs> um, there's a sort of a related question, and you may not have a great answer on this one either, but Bill, do Bill Doolittle wants to know if you can settle a disagreement between him and Jim Neely. Um, do you have an opinion about um, how much land was actually irrigated, the, the hectic acre um, in the Safford area? Do you have an idea? No. no. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, no, no. Bill, you and Jim have to keep fighting. <laughs> That's a number, yes, no. Uh, I, I, uh, that would be a very good exercise to, 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 uh, to, to look at and, and, and undertake. But yes, that that's something that's that's beyond. Uh, I focus on the social side, and uh, um, um, and uh, we have a, a a postdoc, Chris Castledine, who's big into irrigation. So maybe he can he can get onto that. Yeah, and actually, he's going to be speaking next in November about his work in in the um, on on the salt there in the low in Little Gila. So. These are tough um, questions. Wow. Yeah, I know. You got some good ones here. <laughs> well, so here's one. Um, 
Can you explain a little bit more about the hanging canals in terms of what's the water source for those? How are they getting filled with water? Those would be runoff, okay. runoff from those upland coming, the Pinaleno Mountains, Mount Graham is uh, the, uh, where Mount Graham is in, they're in that system. Mm -hmm. And that would be capturing water way up at the heads of, uh, of channels before they broadened out and bringing water all the way down to areas where there are fields. And, um, you know, I refer you to Jim Neely and Don Lancaster's excellent article there where they go into detail. So that really suggests they're farming the hell out of the floodplain if they're having to farm, uh, you know, bring canals off of, uh, you know, off of uh, channels way up, up the mountain. That's also where the immigrants settle as well. So that's, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's another thing to think about. That's where Goat Hill is, that's where Left Hand Canyon is, and that's where Mary Hilda is where, as well. Mm -hmm. So whether there are marginalized migrants that don't have access to the, you know, the good land and the floodplain, and they're forced to use the, um, the land and the, uh, on the, you know, use those canal systems to make, meet their subsistence needs. Mm -hmm. We're getting all sorts of great questions, but it's hard for me to read them all while we're <laughs> while you're talking. Um, there's been a couple questions because there's people on watching that know your um, other research, and there's been a couple questions saying that um, that some of the some some of what you're talking about seems at least somewhat, in some respects, similar to the Tonto Basin. Um, there's been some questions, so there's like a question of how do you account for the lack of platform mounds in the Safford area, for example, and um, there was another one about Tonto Basin stuff. Um, anyway, I think some, some folk who are, yeah, um, yeah, or is there a chance that the ball courts in the Safford Basin were utilized by Tonto Basin folk or anyway, sort of, is there some kind of connection? What do you think? I think the Tano Basin is too far away to, uh, in terms of ball courts. I mean, the, what's interesting about the ball court, the Tano Basin is, the Tano Basin has uh, no ball courts and a lot of platform mounds, right. while Safford has a few ball, ball courts, including some big ones, but no platform mounds. So it's, it's a reverse relationship. Um, Bill has thought that maybe there was a, a platform mound at Buena Vista Curtis, where you have the ball court, that big settlement right at the, at the end of the, right, where the Sapper Basin opens up, but it's it's inconclusive, and um, I, I guess I'm betting there are no platform mounds just because Bandelier and Fuchs went through there early enough that they might have noticed them. Um, but yeah, it may be the fact that I mean the the, the whole com influence definitely diminished during the Classic period, um, and we see more you know kind of a ho com I mean I mean a Mugione uh, kind of interaction going on there to explain uh, the lack of platform mounds. Why there are no ball courts in the Tano Basin is a very good question. Um, mm. There should be <laughs> everything else in the in that time period in the Tano Basin, especially along the salt arm, looks very ho calm. So that's, uh, there's a question of whether there was enough population there. And the answer is probably yes, there should be some villages that should have had ball courts in the Tano Basin. Mm. 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 Um, do you know, is there any evidence of consumption of agave at any of the sites um, that have been excavated out there? And also, um, yes. do you know if cotton, cotton, if cotton was being grown prehistorically out there? Um, yes to agave. Cotton, I'm not so sure about. Um, it, this would be a likely, I mean, cotton is being very much cultivated there right now. Uh, um, and... Um, the work I'm aware of, I, I don't, uh, part of the problem is a lot of these sites that have been excavated by EAC or, or even I, um, I think for, for, by other institutions, there hasn't been a lot of flotation analysis done. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's some, I think for the, some of the, the CRM work has done, uh, the contract work has done some flotation analysis and I can't recall uh, their assemblages. Uh, I know agave is in there. Um, and you would think that cotton would be an important crop given they have the, they have the amount of floodplain they have and the fact that the, they have the first big area where the Gila opens up. But um, no, I, I can't speak to that for, for sure. 
how, how secure do you think the argument is that the gridded gardens are agave? Could, could they have been used for maize or anything? Or is it pretty clear that it's agave? Uh, I, it's argued in that monograph um, that's in the supplemental readings that it's agave. Uh, and uh, I think if you look at them, I mean, uh, they, they, if you saw, saw pictures of them, there, there's no, they're pretty much on a flat uh, uh, terrain. And I've actually surveyed some in other areas of Safford as well. They're not in really good places to do runoff farming, which would be required for maize. Yeah. Um, much more likely that they're being used for, I, I think, agave. Um, um, and uh, so, yeah, I would, I would stick with that. There's been a couple questions. People are curious. Um, is there any kind of connection between Chaco and this part of the world at any time, or are you seeing any any kind of northern San Juan? Or is is that um, really two different things? Going not on? a lot. No, not not a lot. There is some uh, simple whiteware, uh, which is you know kind of generally vaguely associated with Chaco that enters the Safford Basin. In fact, there's a Robinson site. Uh, that dates probably to the 1100s uh, uh, or so, where we have a fair bit of uh, Cibola whiteware. It's kind of a unique assemblage. So, I mean, we get some Cibola whiteware, certainly no great houses. Um, and um, um, I'm trying to think of other Chaco indicators. Now, you know, just, you know, really at the edge, very edge of, uh, of any Chaco influence. Mm. Much more, I think, looking towards Mimbris and whether there's Chaco Mimbris connections is, is another debate. Uh, but looking towards Mimbris, I think that that's there's there's some strong connections there with with Mimbris and, and thinking about Safford as a gateway between Hohokam and Mugion, I think is 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 an interesting avenue of research. Yeah, very good. Mark Severson mentions that there was a huge, huge cache of cotton found in the Pinalinos in a cave some years ago. So it's just- That's little, right. That's little, right. Yes. I and forget he, what- Oh, go ahead. If, they, if, they, if, if it was in a diagnostic vessel or not, but yes. Yeah. No. He also, then, had a, he also wanted to know if- um, Raises the question of whether cotton's traded versus cultivated yeah. too. And that's, that's kind of a hard one to prove, um, you know. Um, because cotton is widely traded between valleys. Um, um, so whether, if you have a cotton cache, is it locally grown or is it, is it traded from somewhere else um, is a possibility, so. He also wanted to know if um, there's any Tucson polychrome in the Safford area. Yes, yes. And why is. would that be interesting? <laughs> For it's those a, of us who it, don't know about Tucson polychrome. <laughs> it's, it's another type of Maverick Mountain. It's, there's two types within that immigrant Ma Maverick Mountain series. There's Maverick Mountain Polychrome and there's Tucson Polychrome, which is a really bad name for it. But it's uh, or uh, there there is Tucson Polychrome in the Safford Basin, and it may go a little bit later than than, than Maverick Mountain. I'm not quite sure of the ratios, uh, but uh, yeah, both both types of Maverick Mountain are are present. Excellent. Um, let's see other kinds of questions. Um, we have a little bit more time. There's been a couple questions, and I think you've sort of addressed it, but folk are really interested about, you know, is there anybody really working in Safford Basin? And it sounds like from what you're saying, um, um, Jim Neely is really the only one who still has some kind of active work going on out there. No, um, and he, he first, he, Jim told me he first visited the uh, Safford Basin the year I was born. I'm 60. I'm attorney. So I mean, Jim is not, Jim, Jim's getting up Hi, there. Hi, Jim. Yeah, I think he's watching, so. Yeah, no, no, but I'm just saying that um, Don Lancaster is a local, uh, a local uh, uh, person working out there. I don't know if, uh, besides maybe an occasional contract per, uh, project, if anybody, you know, is really, you know, youthful, full of energy working in the Safford Basin, because yeah. Kyle, Kyle has moved on and works for Gila River Indian Community. Um, there's dissertation on, on, on canals and along the Middle Hill and the Phoenix Basin. Nan has moved out of the Southwest, Anna Newsel. Yeah, so. Are there any, I mean, you mentioned the Robinson Collection, which is a really great, a great um, find to, to try to help, you know, fill in some of these holes and gaps. Um, 
Do you know, are there any other kinds of extant kind of collections sitting out there in some obscure museums or whatever that, that could, could be worked on more still? Um, the Robinson collection was a treasure. I mean, I mean, it really was a, quite a find and it was, you know, Ray uh, uh, basically was trying to find somebody to take this collection before he passed on and you know, he lived a very long life and fortunately it found a home. Um, no, I mean, the one, one hidden treasure trove would be the Mills' notes, Jack and Vera Mills, who I mentioned at yes. the beginning. They're, they have this incredible collection of slot of polychromes that you can see at, e, at Eastern Arizona College, and you know you should. Um, you can tell what site they came from. They coded them so you can tell what site that they worked in. But uh, all their notes are lost to the ages. So if anybody had any, they said they took extensive notes, and all we have is these really, really, really kind of meager site reports from the sites that they worked in. And if anybody had any clue where their notes were, that would be, a, that would be something, uh, that would be a real treasure trove. Yeah. But other than that, I can't think of any yeah. uh, large collection that's, that's, that's missing. Yeah. Just a note, it sounds like Bob Hard and John Roney are also working in the Safford Basin. So there does sound like there might be a little bit other. Oh, okay. Might, yeah, and so that might be a good thing to follow up on. Okay. Um, let's they're see. working on the early. They may be working on the early side of things, but I may be wrong. I mean, you know, like early, early agriculture. You know, but um, that's that's good to know. Yes. Yeah, it is really good to know. Yeah. Oh, so many people with so much information. Let's see. We're gonna need to wrap this up in a couple of minutes, I think. Yeah. In fact, we probably should. Um, so I probably should try to explain. Um, Jeff, is it possible for you to show that final slide oh, that yes. has the um, website address? Yes, yeah, so let me do that. Yeah. Um, I forgot from, to go there. Yeah, if you could screen share again for us. Thank, I appreciate everybody's patience. Okay. Um, there's, isn't there a final one with the website address on yes, it? There we go, sorry, that's where. There we go, great. I forgot yeah. that. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, so what we're gonna do, um, We'll, we've got a bunch of good questions still left, but poor Jeff has got to, we have to stop and you all have to go listen to the debate or whatever else you're going to do tonight. But um, Jeff will take a look at your questions and your comments and we'll put together some more answers to your questions, maybe some more um, follow up information. And in about a week or so, when this video has also been all edited up and is finished, we'll send everybody out an email to let you know that the, the video is done and that we've posted some some further resources and stuff on the, the cafe page so that you can can hopefully learn more and more. And Jeff says, I think Jeff told me the other day, he's always happy to, to talk more individually with people or answer emails from people. Um, so you can always do that as well. Um, so yeah, we're always happy to talk more about it. And yeah, just to let you know, next next month, we're actually meeting on the second Tuesday of the month to avoid the uh, election Tuesday. So we'll be meeting um, a week later. And Chris Castledine, who is a um, preservation archaeology postdoc with Archaeology Southwest. He joined us in the spring and he's been working with us on, um, he's been working with Jeff on some Tano Basin stuff and on some other work out in the, the lower Gila. But he's going to come and do a talk on his recent research on um, irrigation and social change in the lower salt the Hoakam, um, the lower salt area of Phoenix Basin. So that should be a really fun talk and hopefully we'll see lots of you there. So with that, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. You did a great, great first cafe for the season and we thank you all for coming and yes. we look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the season. Thanks a lot. Good night, everybody. <laughs>